politicians who say they're Christians and the things they actually do, I wouldn't want to become a Christian either. But the issue about Christianity is not Christians, it's about Christ. Don't look at Christians. It's not about Christians. It's not Christians who created you. It's not Christians who can save you. It's not a Christian you're going to stand before on a day of judgment. You're going to stand before Christ. It's not about Christians. It's about Christ. The only thing Christians are are people who've been forgiven. That's all. That's all Christians are, are people who've been forgiven. That's all it comes to. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this evening, we pray for all who are present and for those who are in our midst, Lord God, who perhaps come with a seeking mind, with an inquisitive heart, with honest questions. One thing is for sure, Lord, they're here for a reason. We pray, Lord God, that they'd not hear from Jacob Prash, but they'd hear from Jesus Christ as you speak through your word by the power of your spirit. In his name we pray. Amen. You know, my family are Israeli, and that gives me certain advantages. I can, among other things, speak the Hebrew language, the original language of the Old Testament and so forth. But in the late 1970s, the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, like, he'd be like the Chief Justice of the United States, only for Israel, he did a forensic, academic, juridical review of the trial of Jesus. He commissioned a panel of academic jurists who examined the trials of Jesus from a legal perspective. This is Haim Cohen, the president of the Israeli Supreme Court in 1978-1979. And the conclusion he arrived at, with the help of this panel of forensic experts in academic law and jurisprudence was that according to both Roman law, imperial Roman law, and halakha, Jewish law, according to both Jewish law and Roman law, the trial of Jesus was completely illegal. His trial was illegal. He should not have been executed either by Roman law or by Jewish law. And the conviction was politically motivated. Now, that was the determination of the president of the Israeli Supreme Court. I'd like to begin tonight looking at the trials of Jesus. An illegal trial where an innocent man, who people knew were innocent, was put on trial not once, but three times. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 22, verse 66, after they arrested Jesus. When it was day, the council of elders of the people assembled both chief priests and scribes and led him away to the council chamber, saying, If you're the Messiah, the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you'll not believe. And if I ask a question, you'll not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated on the right hand of the power of God. And they said, Are you the Son of God? And he said to them, Yes, I am. And they said, What further need do we have of testimony? We have heard with our own mouths for ourselves, with his own mouth for ourselves. They asked him a question. Are you the Messiah? Are you the Savior? Are you the one who came into the world to save us from our sin? Well, even if I tell you that, you're not going to believe. You see, these were the Sanhedrin, the most difficult people in the world to see become Christians. The most difficult people to ever have become Christians. It weren't thieves or rebels or prostitutes. It wasn't Roman collaborators. It was the Sanhedrin, religious people. Satan gets more people into hell with religion than he does with all of the sexual immorality, all of the vices, all of the substance abuse, all of the cruelty and injustice put together. People who are thieves know they're thieves. People who are prostitutes know they're prostitutes. A cocaine dealer from the east side of New York like me, I knew I was a cocaine dealer. Nobody had to tell me what I was. Nobody had to tell me what I did. But religious people, they have a false sense of self-righteousness. They think they've got it made because of religion. Religion can save nobody. 
But let's look. Even if I tell you, you won't believe. Are you the Son of God? Yes, I am. Now understand, by calling himself the Son of God, he was making himself deity. If you had a son, your son would be a homo sapien because you are. Your son would be a human being because you're a human being. Well, by Jesus saying he's the Son of God, he was making himself to be a divine being. That was his first trial. The trial before the religious people, only under the Roman occupation, they did not have the power to execute him juridically. That was the reserve of the officials of Rome. So he has to have another trial. The religious trial was simply the indictment, the grand jury. They bring him now before Pilate. We know a lot about Pilate from Josephus, his character, the way he was. He was very much a political animal. Then the whole body of them, in chapter 23, verse 1, arose and brought him before Pilate and began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he said, It is as you say. And Pilate said to the chief priests of the multitudes, I find no guilt in this man. He didn't say he was the emperor or the king of Rome. But they kept insisting, saying, He stirs up the people teaching all over Judea, beginning in Galilee, even as far as this place. But when Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at that time. He referred it to another court. It's not in my jurisdiction. He was a political animal. He knew Jesus was innocent. He knew that the Sanhedrin had a vested interest in deposing him so they could keep religious, political, and financial power for themselves. I find no guilt in this man. And the things they charge him with, forbidding to pay taxes, these are lies. They twisted and distorted things he said. He never taught that. So they bring him before Herod. Herod was not an ethnic Jew. Herod was a Nabataean. He was a Moabite. The Nabataeans were Moabites who converted to Judaism in the Hasmonean period. Actually, he was a Jew by religion as a religion of political convenience. It's sort of like in Texas. Every politician is born again at election time, but at night they go home and pray to an oil well. It was simply the religion of political convenience. But he was not an ethnic Jew. And he was a cultural Roman. Politically and culturally, he was Roman. Ethnically, he was Nabataean. But by religion, he was a Jew. Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he'd wanted to see him for a long time because he'd been hearing about him, and he was hoping to see a sign performed by him, what we call in Hebrew, Nesim Vaniflaot, signs and wonders. Remember, Jesus had healings, but he never had a healing crusade. Jesus had miracles, but he never had a miracle crusade. Biblically, these signs follow. He never allowed signs, wonders, healings, miracles, or any of that to be the focus of his message or his ministry. On the contrary, Jesus warned, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. You see people flocking to arenas and stadiums for this stuff. You see people flocking to arenas and stadiums for this stuff. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. Christ wouldn't do that. The only thing Jesus had to do was put on a show for Herod and they wouldn't have crucified him. But he only did what he saw his father doing. It wasn't about entertainment. Jesus never had a miracle crusade or a healing crusade. He had a repentance crusade. People were healed, but unlike in Lakeland, Florida and such places, the healings could be medically documented. The miracles were verifiable. He wouldn't put on a show. He actually chose to be executed than put on a show. He didn't come to put on a show for anybody. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. 
And he questioned him at length in verse 9, and he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently. Notice it was the religious people who hated him the most. The Romans were only politically interested, wanted to let him go. Herod was self-interested, but the religious people were something else. And Herod, with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before that they had been at enmity with each other. They were political rivals for the favor of Caesar. They didn't even like each other. It is amazing to me how people who don't like each other, how people who hate each other, will still stick together against Christ to this day. You know, the left-wing media, people who believe in things like feminism and gay rights, there's no such thing as feminism or gay rights in the Muslim world. In Saudi Arabia, a woman can't even drive a car. There's no such thing as homosexual toleration in Saudi Arabia or in a country that has Sharia. But of course, in California, when you begin opposing, forcing Christian children to pray and dress up in Islamic costumes in a state taxpayer-funded school in this state, the left-wing media was quick to say, you're an Islamophobe. The previous week, you were a homophobe. Now understand, these feminists and homosexuals have no credence with Muslims. They'd have no cachet in a Muslim country, but they'll still stick together against Christ. You understand? The world hates Jesus Christ. Men love the darkness better than light. They hated him then. They hate him now. And they do so for the same reasons. So the Sanhedrin trial couldn't sentence him. They couldn't convict him. Then the imperial trial, they couldn't convict him. Then the Herodian trial, they couldn't convict him. All three trials failed to get a conviction. There is no evidence. The indictment collapses by any reasonable consideration of the rules of jurisprudence. When all else fails, politicize the court systems. As we speak, the court systems have been politicized in this country. Why do you think the Supreme Court of California ordered to allow same-sex marriage? The legislature didn't vote for that. You didn't vote for that. It was imposed by a court with a political agenda. Jesus warned in the last days we would be brought before magistrates and kings. Notice he put the courts first. We are moving into an age of judicial fascism. We are moving into judicial fascism. Instead of politicians and congressmen and legislators taking the decisions they're elected to take, well, if I'm pro-abortion, I'll lose votes. votes. If I'm anti-abortion, I'll lose votes. We'll let the courts decide. You understand? Judges don't have to worry about getting elected. We're going into judicial fascism. What happened here to Jesus was the same. Court decisions were politically motivated. One of the worst courts in the world is in this state of California and San Francisco. The Ninth District Court. And Pilate summoned the chief priests in verse 13 and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us. All three trials failed to bring a conviction. We found nothing deserving of death. I'll therefore punish him and release him, meaning scourge him, Roman style, which is quite brutal in itself. So he plays the political card. He tries to find a way to get out of it politically. These people hated Caesar. They hated imperial Rome. They hated them. But they'll still stick with Rome against their own Messiah. The gospel makes strange bedfellows. Feminists and Muslims, homosexuals and Darwinists, strange bedfellows. 
No, these people don't like each other. Darwinism says, if somebody is born homosexual, they're genetically inferior because they cannot reproduce. <laughs> there is nothing more antithetical to Darwinism than homosexuality or more antithetical to homosexuality than Darwinism. But they'll stick together against Jesus, against God's Word, and against people who believe it. The gospel will always make strange bedfellows. It'll make people who hate each other allies. As much as they hate each other, they hate God more. Then it continues. Pilate was obliged to release somebody for the Jewish feast of Pesach, Passover. So he figures, I'm going to get a terrorist out here. And everybody knows who and what this terrorist was. And surely I'll be able to spring Jesus and get him off the hook by simply giving them a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. There's a theological term. The theological term is a corporate solidarity. A corporate solidarity. A corporate solidarity in the Bible is where one person is a picture of a bigger group of people. And in the passion narrative of Jesus, this story, we have a number of corporate solidarities. And here we see the first one, Barabbas. Barabbas. His name is not a Hebrew name. If it was Hebrew, it would be Ben Abba. But it's not Ben Abba. It's Bar Abbas, a son of of the Father. A son of the Father. He was somebody who Josephus called the Sikkim. He was from the radical faction of the Zealots. He was a terrorist. Similar to what you would have in Northern Ireland with Protestant and Catholic terrorists. People who are basically gangsters and terrorists but who carry it out under the banner of a religious umbrella. But people really know what they are. Religion and and a political banner is simply the umbrella by which they perpetrate unspeakable crimes even against their own people. And when you read Josephus, Wars of the Jews, what the Zealots did to the other Jews was worse than anything the Romans did to them. This was a bad guy. This was a Charlie Manson. This was somebody everybody knew was no good. But they cried out together, Away with this man! Give us Barabbas! He was one who had been thrown into prison for a certain insurrection made in the city and for murder. And Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them and said, Again, but they kept calling out, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has this man done? I found no guilt in him. He had three trials. I'll punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices that he be crucified their voices prevailed. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand should be granted. And he released the man they were asking for, who'd been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. What do I do with the terrorist, the murderer? What do I do with this man? Who do you want? You want Barabbas or you want Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef Minetzeret? Do I release to you this murderer, who you know is a murderer, or do you want me to release to you the rabbi? Give us the murderer. Give us Barabbas. Give us Charlie Manson. Give us Bin Laden. Free him. What shall I do about this rabbi from Galilee who taught a message of love and peace and forgiveness? The rabbi who raised the little dead girl back to life from the dead. This rabbi who made blind people see, deaf people hear, who made crippled people walk, who healed lepers. This man whose message was one of love and reconciliation. What shall I do with this rabbi from Nazareth? <laughs> Crucify him. Give us the terrorist. Here is the point. Barabbas, Bar Abbas, son of the father. 
Barabbas was actually guilty of the things Jesus was falsely accused of. Barabbas was a rebel. He was guilty of sedition. He was guilty of trying to stir up the people to rebel against the authorities. Barabbas was actually guilty of the things that Jesus was falsely accused of. But Barabbas went free because the innocent man, innocent of those same charges, was going to the cross. Barabbas is a corporate solidarity. The day I was born again, my name was in a sense changed. My name became Barabbas. Barabbas. I became a son of the Father. Yes, I was a communist and a Marxist in my teenage years. At university, I would firebomb police cars in demonstrations against the Vietnam War. Not long later, I was addicted to cocaine and dealing it. I knew what I was. I'm not proud of it, but I can't deny what I was and what I did. I was a fornicator. I was a rebel. I was seditious. I was a drug dealer. There's a lot of things I'm not proud of. But today I'm a son of the Father. The reason I am a son of the Father is because the Son of God came to earth to go to that cross in my place. I was guilty of the re rebellion. I was guilty of the sedition. I was a Marxist. I was actually guilty of the things that Jesus died for in my place. Barabbas is a picture of me, and he's a picture of you. We are all rebels. We are all in rebellion against our maker. Hollywood, in the state of California, is in rebellion. The crooked politicians in Washington are in rebellion. Everything and everybody is in rebellion, including the Sanhedrin, including the religious establishment, including many people who go to church this Sunday. Like the Sanhedrin, it's become about money and power, not about love, truth, and forgiveness. Barabbas. Don't call me Jacob. Call me Barabbas. My Messiah went to the cross in my place so I could become a son of the Father. But if you're here tonight and you've not accepted Jesus, your name is Barabbas. One of two things are going to happen. You're going to go to San Quentin for your own crimes or you're going to accept the fact that Jesus has already paid the price. He was already sentenced for what you did. That's too good of a deal to turn down, given the fact you really are guilty. You're as guilty as Barabbas. You're as guilty as I was. We are all guilty. The only one who is innocent is the one who was sentenced in our place. I hope tonight you'll realize God wants to be your father. He wants to call you Barabbas, a son of the father. But then it continues. Verse 26, when they led him away, they laid hold of one Simon of Serene coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And there were following him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus turned to them, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. Days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. They'll begin to say, to the mountains fall on us, to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what will happen in the dry? We have our next corporate solidarity. His name is Shimon, Simon the Serene, coming in from the country. It was a pilgrim feast of the Jews, Passover, and people were coming from all over. He thought he just happened to be in town at that particular day, at that particular time. But there was another plan for him. Not just the plan of man, 
but the plan of God. You might just happen to be in town today. Maybe a Christian friend invited you to come to Calvary Chapel, meet some people, hear some music. You're here for a reason. But it's not the plan of men. It's the plan of God. Notice what Simon does. He picks up Jesus' cross and walks after him. He walks behind Jesus in verse 26. Jesus said, if you will be my disciple, pick up your cross and follow me. He had to walk after Jesus carrying the cross. Let me tell you why I no longer sell cocaine, why I no longer inject cocaine, Let me tell you why I no longer shack up with my girlfriend and why I no longer firebomb police cars. I will tell you why. Because that person was crucified with Christ. The day he called me in Greenwich Village of New York City, I picked up my cross and began to follow him. That drug dealer was crucified My name is Simon. I hope your name will also be Simon. You see, Jesus didn't just say, I'm going to die for your sin. He didn't just say, I'm going to pay the price for what you did. I'm going to die in your place. He said, pick up your cross and die with me. Crucify that homosexual. Crucify that substance abuser. Crucify that alcoholic. Crucify that compulsive gambler, and above all, crucify that good, upright, church-going citizen who's so blinded by religion that they don't know they're on the path to eternal judgment. But then there's another corporate solidarity. Verse 32, the others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they were crucified. They crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves, fulfilling a prophecy from Psalm 22 that was written 800 years earlier. 800 years earlier. What was it that prompted me to believe this? You see, like most people of my generation, the hippies and things like this, what later became known as New Age, I'd read the Bhagavad Gita and I knew about the Tibetan Book of the Dead and I knew about the, the occult and all these things. But you know, Nostradamus was always a matter of, well, how do you want to interpret it? The scriptures were not like that. Imagine me saying 800 years from now, 800 years from now, somebody was going to be born in Bethlehem, the very town, who his ancestors would be, that he would die by crucifixion 600 years before crucifixion was invented. Things he could have no control over. They would gamble for his clothes. He'd be betrayed by his friend. The price his friend would betray him for. Literally the price, 30 pieces of silver. More than that, things that he could have no control over, that he'd make the Gentile nations believe in the Jewish God. Because salvation would come from the Jews, anti-Semitism was in the human condition. People have always hated Jews. We hate you, Jew, but we want to believe in your God. We hate you, Jew, but we believe your scripture. We hate you, Jew, but we believe your Messiah, Jesus. Salvation comes from the Jews. These were not vague matters of interpretation. How do you want to interpret it? These are dozens and dozens and dozens of things written over periods of centuries. Exactly, precisely, foretelling literal events that can be proved to have transpired. I could prove with history and archaeology that the New Testament was written 
centuries after the Tanakh, the Old Testament, how could these things have been predicted in such detail so many centuries earlier? That's not true of Nostradamus. That's not true of the Book of Mormon. That's not true of the Koran. That's not true of the Bhagavad Gita. That's not true of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. But it is true of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. There was a witch in New Jersey. I used to buy drugs from her husband. I'd get him LSD, he'd get me pot. And she saw she was a witch. And she <clears throat> saw in tarot cards I was going to become a Christian. And she began freaking out with the tarot cards. Don't you come back and burn me. Don't you burn me when this happens. I said, what are you talking about, don't burn you? Calm down, roll the joint. What are you talking about? Don't you burn me. <laughs> yeah, there's a demonic power in these things. There's a counterfeit spirituality. That's what the New Age movement is. But thank God I found the genuine. He found me. And they took him to the place of the skull and he prayed, Father, forgive them. God blames nobody for the death of his son except himself and Judas and Satan. But he blames everybody for rejecting the salvation that comes from the death of his son. Father, forgive them. I know who nailed Jesus to the cross. I did and you did. I'm as guilty of his death as the Roman soldiers. I'm as guilty of his death as the Sanhedrin. But all he could say is, Father, forgive them. He's not going to hold anybody accountable for his death. But he's going to hold everybody accountable for not accepting his forgiveness when he paid for our sin with his death. God took my sin and put it on Jesus in order to put his righteousness on us. And he said a time is going to come where it will be so bad that people will not want to have children. They will thank God for infertility. They will be hiding and say, cover us of the terrible things that are going to happen. And we already see events transpiring in our world exactly foretold in Scripture. But then it continues. They stood by looking in verse 35, looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him. He saved others, let him save himself. If he's the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers, the Romans, mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, this is the king of the Jews. Only the Messiah could be both a king and a priest. A king had to be a descendant of David, but a high priest had to be a descendant of Aaron. When Jesus went to the cross, he was the high priest making atonement, blood atonement on the altar for our sin, but he was the king. Only the Messiah could be both king and priest. Now, in Christ, we're all kings and we're all priests. But even though we're all kings, we will all co-reign with Jesus when he comes back to set up his kingdom. He's the king of kings, the Melech HaMlechim. We're all kings, but he's the king of kings, Melech HaMlechim. And we're all priests. We're all called to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. But he's our high priest. He's the high priest. Only the Messiah can be both king and priest. Now look what it says. One of the criminals who hung there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed justly, for we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He was framed. His trials were illegal. And he was saying to Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. We call them thieves, two of them, just as they were criminals. 
There's good thieves and there's bad thieves. Only God defines good thieves and bad thieves differently than we do. In God's economy, a good thief is one who knows he's been caught. In man's economy, a good thief is one who doesn't get caught. Again, a corporate solidarity. Good thieves and bad ones. Good criminals and bad ones. Maybe you've never stolen a paper clip, though I doubt it. But God says, thou shalt not covet. You even desire that which belongs to somebody else. As far as God's concerned, you've stolen it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. As far as God's concerned, you lust after somebody's husband or somebody's wife. You've slept with them. Thou shalt not murder. You hate somebody. As far as God's concerned, you've murdered them. We're all murderers. We're all liars. We're all thieves. Jacob Prash is a murderer. Jacob Prash is a liar. Jacob Prash is a thief. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. No matter who you are, tonight you're a liar. No matter who you are tonight, you're a murderer. No matter who you are tonight, in the eyes of your maker, you are a thief. And you will one day give account. You will stand before him as a liar, a thief, and a murderer. The only question is, are you a good thief or a bad one? That's the only question. Now again, the world says a good thief is one who doesn't get caught. <laughs> Believe me, everybody gets caught. God doesn't miss a move. Now notice they both called out to Jesus. But the first one said, if you're the Messiah, save yourself so you can save us. Verse 39, save yourself and us. Notice there's people who are more than happy to call on Jesus as long as they think Jesus is going to get them off the hook in this life and this world. What can you do for me now? All kinds of people will get religion when they're in a jam. When they're in trouble financially or have a crisis in family or in health. When they're in trouble legally, boy, do they get religion. What can you do for me now? Can you get me off the hook now? Oh, Jesus, what can you do for me now? In fact, the crooked televangelists are telling people, except Jesus, God wants you rich, blab it and grab it. What can you do for me now? As long as they think he's going to do something for them in this life or this world, they're more than happy to believe. What can you do for me now? He can't help people like that. Now, don't get me wrong. The Lord has done many things for me in this life or this world. Many things. The Lord has gotten me out of many jams. He's gotten me out of many corners I've painted myself into. He's gotten me off the hook more times than I can count. But that's not the main point. In fact, ultimately, that's not the point at all. He got me off. I was guilty. I was sentenced justly. He was sentenced innocently. The just for the unjust. I should have been crucified for the things he was crucified for. But he who should not have been crucified was crucified in my place. Let me tell you about love. Real love. Not what society calls love. Not what the world calls love. Not what Hollywood calls love. Not what the pornographers call love. This is what God calls love. If you were the only person who ever sinned against God, no matter who you are, black, white, Hispanic, male, female, it doesn't matter. 
You're not the only person who ever sinned against God, but even if you were the only person who ever sinned against God, God would have still become a man and gone to the cross just for you personally. He would have gone through the whole thing just for you. Now it so happens you're not the only one who ever sinned against God, but even if you were, he would have gone through the whole bit just for you. That's how important you are to your maker. That's how much he loves you. But to be nailed to a cross, tortured, to death under the judgment of God, that's how much he hates sin. You should have been tortured to death. I should have been tortured to death. But instead, Jesus was. The innocent man, instead of the guilty one. Yes, I was a thief, a murderer, a liar, a criminal, a rebel. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Then he can help you. He may bless you and help you in this world. But even if he doesn't, he can get you off. You know, my family are Jewish, and I gave my children a choice when they grew up. I said, listen, after college, I can put you through law school. I can put you through medical school. I can put you through dental school. Or I can put you through the wall. What's it going to be? <laughs> Jewish kids are either lawyers, doctors, or certified public accountants. Well, I've got a great Jewish accountant. His name is Jesus. Anytime I've been in financial straits when I had to go through seminary with the family by faith, yeah, my Jewish accountant knew how to fiddle the books in my favor. How did I get delivered from substance abuse? I had a great Jewish doctor. He only took away the addiction. He took away the desire for the drugs. Yeah, I've got a great Jewish accountant. I've got a great Jewish doctor. But not least of all, I have a great Jewish lawyer. He got me off big time. I was in trouble. I was in big trouble. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, you're in big trouble. Believe me, you need a really good Jewish lawyer. <laughs> There's only one person who can get you off, and it's not F. Lee Bailey. Are you a good one or a bad one? Barabbas, a son of the father, the innocent man who should have walked, went to the cross, so you can walk out this door tonight, a son of the father. You can walk out that door on your way to heaven instead of going on your way to hell as a son of the living God the God of Israel, because an innocent man paid the price for what you did. We can call you Barabbas. But he never said to make converts. He said, make disciples. You see, he went to the cross, but you have to pick up your cross and follow him. You have to ask him for the power and grace to stop living the way you've been living. Believe me, if he can deliver me from addiction and fornication, he can deliver anybody. I used to wake up in the morning, spit some cocaine, roll a joint. That was my life. Shacking up with my girlfriend, that was my life. There was no way I ever would have even had the desire to follow Jesus 
if he didn't intervene in my life. But he did. And he said, pick up your cross and follow me. My name is Simon. Everybody calls on Jesus when they're in trouble. But the fact is, we're all in more trouble than we realize. If you only want him to help you in this life or this world, he can't help you. He's not interested. But if you want him to remember you when you come into his kingdom, oh, he can help you. Yes, you're a criminal. Yes, you're a liar. Yes, you're a thief. The only question I pose to you tonight, are you a good one or a bad one? One thing I can promise you, if you repent of your sin and ask Jesus to forgive you and you walk out that door, a son of the Father, you will never regret it. And I don't just mean in this life, you will never regret it for all eternity. But if you walk out that door without repenting of your sin and accepting Jesus, you will regret it for all eternity, more than you can ever possibly fathom. Pick up your cross and follow him. But his burden is light. He's given me more than I can handle in my strength. But he's never given me a burden to carry more than I can not handle in his strength. That good thief is rejoicing and will be rejoicing for all eternity because he was a good thief. That bad one doesn't know how bad he really was. That's it. Do you want to be a Barabbas? Do you want to walk out that door a son of the Father? Do you want to be Simon and pick up the cross and follow Jesus? Do you want to be a good thief or a bad one? He never should have been convicted. But the reason he was convicted is because he was my proxy. He never should have been convicted, but the reason he was convicted is because he was your proxy. Now why will you take the rap for something for which you are guilty? when somebody else has already done the time, gone to the chair. You've got to be crazy not to accept Jesus Christ. I've said all I can say. If you came here tonight and you heard Jacob Prash, you should have stayed home and watched the Bugs Bunny cartoon. (laughs) But if you know what I'm saying is true, you haven't heard Jacob Prash. You've heard Jesus Christ calling you to come up and repent of your sin and accept his forgiveness. He's calling you, come up, Julie. Come up, Fred. Come up, Bob. Come up, Carolyn. Come up, Barabbas. Come up, Simon. Be a good thief. Now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. It is very easy to become a follower of Jesus. He paid the price for what you did. He loves you so much that he became a man and was nailed to the cross in your place that if you ask him to forgive you, he'll make you a new creation. He'll put his spirit inside of you and he will give you the power to follow him. Everything you ever did will be blotted out of the memory of God. What do you do with a corpse? You bury it, you get baptized. And you meet together with other people. The only thing Christians are are people who've been forgiven. I'm not talking about religion. Religion is worthless. I'm talking about the relationship, the gospel. In a relationship, you communicate. When you pray, you talk to God. When you read his word, he talks back to you. But then he uses you to tell other people 
the good news that you have found for yourself. If you want to be Barabbas tonight, if you want to be Simon, if you want to be the good thief, if you realize what a mess you are in, and you need a really, really good advocate to get you off the hook, you've come to the right place. Tonight is your night to come to faith in the living God. Pastor? We just want to uh, give you that opportunity tonight. I'm going to invite Bo and the team up. Um, and we just want to give you that opportunity. If you want to receive that salvation, that gift that the Bible talks about, that indescribable gift, would you say?